Welcome to Tinfoil Helmets, your occasional spicy hot take roundup of the latest F1 rumours, all with the most believable conspiracy theories to back them up. Everything here is carefully researched for hours to make sure it's totally founded in logic, reason, and truth. Or not. Who knows? Anyway, I'm Dominic. I'm the British part of this duo to talk about your F1 world's excitement. And I'll hand it over to my other co-host. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm the American half of this podcast. And, uh... Let's jump right into, uh, have we gotten anything right so far? And uh, at the end of last episode, I said Albert Park was going to be uneventful. And wrong. I could not have been more wrong. <laughs> uh, I will say, like, towards the end, lap, f- uh, until, like, lap 40 to lap, say, 55, was like, okay, this looks like it's going to be a bit of a stalemate. Uh, but then, uh, yeah. Things mag- happened. Yeah, Magnuson's tire decided to uh, yeet itself away from its car. Was it really that the tire decided to yeet it away from the car, or did Magnuson just forget that he was driving a race car and where the wall was? Uh, I'm not entirely sure I actually ever saw what was uh, what happened in that oh. incident, but I think oh. at that point we were, what well, you and I both watched it live, we are both on the west coast of the US, and at that point it was well past midnight, or getting on there, and it's like, oh my gosh, this race is getting very weird. It was. It was. It was late and it was strange. Uh, so what else did we get right? Uh, usually at least one good accident, which you predicted. Turns out we got that one right. Not one, not two, but three good accidents. I mean, I think we're incredibly lucky that Albon didn't roll further back onto the track. Yeah. That could have been really terrifying. It, it was terrifying, and it didn't look like he necessarily did anything wrong. Like, the, the number of replays we got to see during the um, the restart, like, he just was going around that corner, and the car was like, bye! Uh, he, and, and I even was, on I was that, surprised. Even after that, when he, uh, after he kind of came to a stop, he rolled back forward to try to get himself out of the firing line, because he knew kind of where he was. Yeah. So, yeah. so you actually look, and he, he tried to get himself out of the way. So he even, I'd say, incredible kudos to Alex Albon for recognizing the danger of the situation and trying to do the best he could with his incredibly damaged car to minimize any sort of drama there. Uh, do, you, do you remember the onboard from uh, Guan Yu Zhou that was right behind him? That was... He was like, that was almost uh, Gasly in Japan, but at least he could see what was going on this time. Um, yeah. It was real close. Yeah, well, great, great job that every that despite all the incidents, everybody was perfectly safe this weekend. I don't even think anybody spent any time in the medical center like it was. No, it was good. It was yeah. good. Which I think is, as much as uh, Formula One has had some terrible incidents in the past, it's always great when you see that... Uh, all the things like the survival cells that they've done and, you know, prevent tires from flying away from cars for the most part. Like, you know, it, it's all it's all worth it. Excitement without the risk. Yeah. Okay, third one. Uh, also from you, uh, a team without points scores points. You were right. Did McLaren shoot themselves in the foot? How so? Because right now, looking over at the Constructors' Championships, or the Constructors' standings, they have moved all the way up into fifth place with 12 points. Who knows how many other crazy races we'll see. Can the Williams score 12 points on the season? Can the Alpha Tauri score 12 points on the season? Can the Alpha Romeo score 12 points on the season? Do we, Will we have enough crazy races to where... Some people can overtake uh, McLaren to the point of they can get the wind tunnel time and testing time that they need to make their brick a little bit more aero. So, yeah, great result for Lando, great result for Oscar, but, uh, you know, do, do they also want five-second penalties to push them back to 12th? I see. You're, you're saying the, uh, the McLaren team didn't really want the points because now they know that they've got a tractor. They want to be able to spend as much time improving the tractor, and because certain other people managed to bend their cars with a semi-regular basis this weekend, they have put themselves into such a position that they are unlikely to be at the bottom because nobody else is going to be able to perform as well, because while they're crap, so is everybody else. Yes, yeah, like... Oh, uh, okay, I, yeah. I, can, I can almost subscribe to that. I have, there's a whole diatribe later on about how, how I feel about the, the McLaren situation. Yeah, and the, uh, the final thing that we, uh, we predicted was Merck will come fourth and fifth because Ferrari will... Uh, Ferrari. And, uh, well, Ferrari Ferrari'd. They did. They, ex- they, they exceeded expectations for their ability to Ferrari. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it was... Uh, I think Charles was just kind of in a bad, bad luck sort of stuff. Yeah. He didn't go the full Ferrari, but... 
But oh man, Signs was just the most Ferrari driver this weekend. He got the uh, he pitted right before the red flag, uh, so then he was out of sequence. Uh, did a great job driving through the field, I must say. And then uh, on that last restart, man, just yeah, <laughs> we'll get to that for sure. The, the thing that I thought that was so interesting about Ferrari Ferrariing is compared to last year, where they clearly. They, they had the pace for, like, the first third of the season to be able to fight with Red Bull. Ferrari have made a, a proper step backwards. And so, like, not only do you have the normal Ferrari ferrari I feel they have peaked. I th- feel they are past the uh, uh, the point where they, 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 go, they have their opportunity to be able to succeed uh, at winning a world championship. I think it's interesting to see that they managed to pull that off this time yet again. Like, they had pace, but they weren't really there for the entire race. Th- this moves us great into like some of the drama that happened between um, Jetta and uh, Australia. Yes. Of, did you see the comment signs made of they found a second per lap uh, in pace and they expect that development to hit at Imola? I did not see that. I, I saw he made some comment that the the judgment that people were throwing at the team was unfair, but I hadn't seen a second. Well, last time we heard that, it was from the Blobby team. I mean, sorry, Mercedes, who thought that they had a second to lap. Yeah, they, they said, uh, Science came out and said that apparently they found something that was really low-hanging. It'll be there. It, they'll have the upgraded Imola, and it'll improve a second a lap on the car. And, man, with all the luck Ferrari has suffered or lack of luck they've suffered this year so far, like, they're going to need a second a lap to be anywhere near any sort of title fight towards the end of the season. Well, the thing is, they might get a second a lap. But what they're going to do to destroy that second a lap by making reliability poor life choices, strategy poor life choices, or just have Leclerc bottle it at the last moment when he's in the lead. Stand by, we're checking. Checking? We are checking? And uh, Lewis and Lando also went golfing. They did. I was surprised at that. And I also thought that it was uh, telegraphing the future. They are getting ready to be teammates. Like, Lando doesn't just golf with anybody. He golfs with the people he sees as friends and the people he wants to work with. So he's chosen to bring Lewis into that special club because eventually there'll be the Lewis and Lando show. I think, however, Lando said on Twitch that he was just at the range. Lewis showed up with his uncle and they invited Lando to, to play with them. But that's just cover. Oh, okay. Like that's, how you, that's how you remove all the suspicion is you just provide the cover story, right? We've all watched Area, uh, was it Independence Day? You know, the $20,000 toilet seat. It's just plausible deniability. Oh, I happened to show up at the range at the same time as Lewis. What a shock. How did that happen? Well, how many golf courses can there be in Monaco? Was it in Monaco or was it in Australia? I have no idea, to be honest with you, but I mean, okay. they're either in Monaco or Aus- or the same place in Australia, and they're probably not going to the public course, so no. I-, I imagine that the uh, the world of them uh, coming through is-, is rather small. Yeah, it was interesting, but it was good to see them playing golf. Like uh, I, I, What I missed and what I wanted somebody to tell about was how, uh, how well Lewis did t- compared to Lando, because Lewis, being the competitive person that he is, and Lando, the person who's been playing a lot of golf... I'm really curious to know whether Lewis beat Lando or Lando beat Lewis. I think from the comments from Lando, I I think Lando was surprised at how good Lewis was, but I think if we're talking about uh, the Drivers' Golf Championship, I would definitely think Lando is uh, is in line to win that one. Lewis is so competitive that I feel he's the type of person who would make comments and not golf in public eye for months, if not years, while he spends as much time as possible practicing until he is an amazing golfer. And then go golfing and be like, ah, oh, you know, I just dabble. I just dabble. All right, I can absolutely ship Lewis and Lando as the ultimate British teammate pairing. But where does this happen? Uh, I don't think it happens at Mercedes because J- no. Toto's gonna, not going to let go, go of uh, Golden Boy George. No. I don't think it happens with McLaren because that would mean that you're ditching Patrese very quickly. Piastri. I don't think that happens at McLaren because you're ditching Piastri very quickly. <laughs> I think I'm going to keep that in the edit. Oh, uh, please don't. Yeah, well, uh, but you've got to you see. You're, you're thinking next season. I'm thinking 2025. Like oh. Piastri's clearly on a two-year thing, so we'll see what happens. And then uh, Lewis will go take a year out because he's decided that he doesn't want to do it anymore. He's going to he's going to do a Nando, right? He'll take a year out, he'll go do something else, and he'll be like, you know, I really like F1, and I'm going to come back to where I started. Oh, I don't think he'll come back to McLaren. 
I don't think you let me finish. Okay, go on. It's going to be Aston Martin because uh, Fernando Alonso is going to retire. Lawrence will decide Stroll is not worth the seat he's in, and he'll need. And they want the two British drivers to prop up the Aston Martin brand. I can I can subscribe to that hard. I think that is a definite plausibility. The question is, is does Lewis take a year out before then? That no, I think if Lewis quits F one, he's done because we've seen before he dabbles so much in so many other things from mm. his his hit single with Christina Aguilera to you know his his clothing line with Tommy Hilfiger. That is a guy who, you know, he is not my favorite driver on the grid, but man, he. I, he just he can hustle like nobody else. Like that guy is he is one of those people that just like doesn't seem to sleep, is always energized, must have his hand in some sort of project. I respect yeah. the hell out of Lewis Hamilton, even if he's not my favorite driver. That guy is just always on top of something. Okay. Okay. So it's it's one and done for Lewis. If he's I, gonna do it, he's gonna go. Yeah, he'll find something else that he's incredibly passionate about and is gonna devote all of his energy there because I don't think he can sit still. I, I will subscribe to that, and I will. Uh, I'll have to place the opposite bet because there's there's, there's, a, there's a, a real world bet I would consider making, which is Lewis will retire at the end of this season. But I'll take in the second bet that if he doesn't retire at the end of this season, he will eventually end up Aston Martin. I think that's with Lando. Yeah. Uh, keeping on McLaren briefly, uh, let's let's hit our brand new segment. Uh, is Zach McBrown still the McLaren CEO? I believe at time of recording he is. He is, and I think he's saved by the points that were scored this weekend. Uh, I would hope that the people that run McLaren uh, are smart enough to go, well, it wasn't really because you had, your car was any good, but at the same time, you still have to give them credit for not bending it or breaking it or having it fall apart. But I, I, st- I still think it is uh, it is on the bubble about whether he will be uh, CEO by the time we get to mid-season. Uh, other news, uh, te- Tech Directive 39 was repealed. Um, I am definitely one of those people that loves the technical aspect side of Formula One. So uh, for those who are unaware, the technical directive 39 referred to, I believe, the ride height sensors on the uh, on the cars that helped try to prevent porpoising. That bit was repealed. The flexi floors were not repealed. So mm-hmm. I did notice there was a little bit of porpoising that was going on at, at Albert little, Park. A little bit. A little bit. Did you see the Alfa Romeo? It was a kangaroo. It was dung, 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 down the straight. It I mean, was ridiculous. It's one of those, like, how much is that the benefit of you are on a street circuit and street circuits are going to be a little bit bumpier compared to a purpose-built circuit? So and... I spent the last year watching that, and I was trying to work out whether, which one, whether the bounce was crappy suspension or whether the bounce was porpoising. And if you look very carefully... When you watch a car porpoise, the whole car goes down. The front and back go down at the same time. It doesn't weave. It doesn't go front, back, front, back, front, back. When the suspension's crappy, because it's a crappy track, um, you'll see the front and then the back, and the car kind of pivots around the center point. as The front hits the bump, and then it leaves the bump, and then the back hits the bump. But when you look at that porpoising, the whole car goes up and down in unison. Uh, and so apparently Lewis was also complaining that the car was bouncing on uh, free practice one, he said the poor poisoning was back. And so it's interesting they dialed it out. Yep. Well, it'll be interesting to see how, how this evolves because it also seemed like by raising the ride height, they were effectively making the racing worse uh, given that cars were generating more dirty air and they, were, they weren't getting the ground effect that they needed to follow as closely as they needed. And for the most part, we saw some very close following racing throughout, uh, throughout Australia. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, the F1 CEO also wants to get away with free practice. Um, I'm honestly okay with this, so long as I think they need to do something along with, with the tier development. Obviously, we've had the uh, the testing ban for a while now, and you know you can only test your car at these certain test events. And I think if you want to do away with free practice, that's fine. But give the teams, you know, similar to how you see the wind tunnel time and the CFD time, give them some on track testing time and say, you know, if you're the worst. If you're the worst team of the worst and you want to spend 20 hours of on-track testing, you go spend 20 hours of on-track testing. And if you are the reigning constructors championship, maybe you only get like two hours of on-track testing. Like 
So I, I think there's a there's a way to bring back uh, on track live testing. I think that would be very beneficial for some of the teams to validate not only their CFD and wind tunnel models, but maybe give a new driver a chance to practice and hone something in. And I also don't really care what track they go to. Do whatever track you want to go to. I think I think it's it's interesting to look at it through the lens of there's the uh, spectacle aspect of it which I think is where F1 comes from. But the reality is, especially with the removal of, or the, the reduction from 90 minutes to an hour, you've lost that testing that you, you talk about. Like in that hour, it's so impacted by people bending the cars, cars breaking down. It becomes it becomes the true meaning of the word practice, which is the driver to drive around and you know just check everything works okay and make sure it's working. And I think that if we're going to get rid of it, you have to replace it, as you say, with some sort of other avenue for that testing. Because otherwise, how do you... How do you validate your cars? How do you make sure that they're not going to fall apart? Because some of that requires you to drive around for two or three hours to make sure it doesn't break, let alone whether it's a good car to drive or not. I also don't quite really understand what he wants to replace it with, because if you're going to get rid, like, in terms of the spectacle of the weekend, if you get rid of free practice, great. What are you going to fill it with? Another race with points? That just seems weird. Like, how many? It's like, we've got a sprint race, we've got a slightly longer sprint race, and we've got the real race. I don't quite follow what he wants to achieve with that because the reality is is F1 makes a lot of their money from the time that people watch on TV and also the hosting fees that they get. So if you get rid of basically a day and a half of action on track for the big scary driver, uh, like what's the promoter going to fill it with instead, right? Is the attempt here to bring up F1, uh, F2, F3 and F1 Academy? I don't know. I, I, I feel there's a gap in his thinking, or at least the way he talks about it. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those uh, free practice doesn't make the cash machine go burr. Yeah, but what are you going to replace it with that makes it does make it go burr? Right, and I mean, I think we've already seen with some of the um, some of the sprint race weekends, like for those of us that don't work in continental Europe like sometimes those quality times that we want to watch don't necessarily overlap well with our our day jobs yes yeah. it's like people have jobs and they don't get the opportunity to sit around and watch it on a friday and the last uh, between waste drama which is kind of will help us dovetail neatly into uh australia was uh the discussion of every driver's 101st podium is a p1 and will alonso continue the trend well it turns out not so much which leads us into australia what are our thoughts on Australia? I thought Australia was an amazingly exciting race, but also very much a race of what what if. Because, just kind of tee us off, uh, like, the, the biggest what if is, I think, around George Russell. Because, mm -hmm. let's say Alex Albon didn't bin it. Then you had George complaining on the radio, with Lewis closing up on George and Max closing up on Lewis. That could have been an amazing battle to watch. And instead, do you do? Do you really think it would have been a battle to watch? Uh, I think Max could have gotten two Mercedes in one straight, and that would have been absolutely hilarious. Sure, but that'd have been like six seconds, and then we'd have had Lewis complaining and end up in third, and then George running around saying, "Well, are you what? Who? I'm. I can't keep up with him. This car's crap." Yeah, I mean, I think it would have been definitely interesting to see some some George versus Lewis stuff. Um, I want to see those two battle on track. Uh, to see yes. how it goes and uh, not just hear George whining about them ba not battling on track or you're telling me yeah. to you're telling me to manage the situation while my teammates closing up behind me and the 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 championship leader is closing up behind him I, I really hated that I didn't like the fact that he was like what was it lap six it was relatively early and he was like oh you know we shouldn't be you know you should tell me this or that it's like okay it's early in the season Merck have a policy of early in the season, there's no rules, so get on with it. Like, shut up, shut up, or put up. And I felt like he was just, it's like, it's like you listen to Lewis, that, when, sometimes when he's whining about his tires or the team putting him on the wrong strategy. Lewis has defined that as his character, especially after he's got so many world championships, and to a certain extent I feel like he has the right to do that. But George hasn't proven himself yet, so driving around the car just because he's in front and then whining, it's like, get on with it please, this is ridiculous. Lewis definitely had some wonderful tire thoughts throughout the race. I was I was happy to get some tire thought Lewis. I love tire thought Lewis. He's, he's a he's a, a thought fluencer on the subject of tire management. Yeah. What what do you think? For every ten tire comments, eight are I don't think the tires are great, and maybe occasionally we get two that are uh, these tires are really good. 
Yeah, and it is guaranteed that the moment Lewis says his tires are good, he will be called in to change them. It's, like, guaranteed. And at this point, you know, I'd like to think that there's some conspiracy theory that it's secret code words, but I just think the team's incompetent, and he's incompetent in the context of judging the quality of the tires, because it's always wrong. He either says they're brilliant, in which case they call him in, or he says that they're terrible, and they call him in and doesn't do him any good anyway. <sighs> Is he wrong, though? Because towards the end of that race, before we ended up in the double red flag situation... We had some really good racing, and then everybody was starting to spread out a little bit. Alonso was dropping back from Hamilton. Sainz was dropping back from Alonso. It pretty much started to end up in a stalemate because nobody had the tires left to burn through. It's less a comment on his on the specifics opinions of the tire and how it's performing. It's in the relationship with the rest of the team. Like he and the team are in some unholy mess because they can't get it right. He either put him on the wrong ones and he whines and complains about it and then doesn't drive because he's in a half. Or he says that they're great and they call him in anyway and then they put him on the wrong tyres and he complains that he's in a half. Like, rarely does... Is there ever a comment that the team made absolutely the right call, we picked the right strategy, we picked the right tyres at the right time? It'd be interesting to sit in on some of those debriefs and hear what Lewis has to say about the tyres because I absolutely believe going on the right tyre... Their hard tyre was the right call. But I absolutely think Lewis was 100% correct that those tires were going to be iffy to the end. Even Pirelli said those tires were going to be iffy to the end. And I think the concept of, you know, yeah, those tires might not make it, but it's going to be faster than you going like medium, medium or something along those lines. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the, that's the paradox is maybe the right word, the quandary that the F1 tires have, which is they either need to make them so that they're just great for, you know, 80 laps and be done with it. And we don't really have to stop. Or there needs to be something that's a bit more, um, they need to fall off quicker, and I know that causes a lot of people to be very annoyed, but the reality is you have these tires that kind of squeak to the end, and then everybody kind of gets into a war of attrition, right? He who can make them last makes them last. He who doesn't gets screwed, and you don't, you don't in reality get to make... You don't get to win an advantage by making a, t- a good tire choice or, or a contrary a contrarian tire choice, just because everybody like collapses on the same result. Like I'd love for people to go, I think I can do medium, medium, because I know that the hard's going to drop off at this point, and it's going to drop off so fast and so quickly that I'll be able to make it, and you'll be able to play that. But what happens is, is they, they grade out, and so that there's this, oh, well, maybe just a little bit more, one more lap, oh, can I do it? Oh, it's okay, maybe there's a safety car. And I feel like, it, it, I mean, it's the greatest quandary that F1's had for like years, getting the tires right. Like, They've never gotten it right, right. Well, you know what we need? A tire war. Oh, we should bring back... Who is it? Did Bridgestone were bidding this year, apparently. They put the tender out for the new tires, and uh, Bridgestone have said that they will, in fact, be bidding on F1 tires. Yeah, I mean, who wants, who wants to run Bridgestones? Who wants to run Pirellis? I think it could be interesting. Now, there's an interesting way to spice up the race. Sprint race is Bridgestone, and the, f- the full race is Pirellis. Just to oh, mess with things. What about... Uh, there are 10 teams... Uh, eat, we we promised the tire suppliers they each get five teams, and the, and the teams get to pick their tire supplier in reverse championship order. So every week? No, no, for for like the season. Oh, oh so based on where you were last year? Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, I get yeah. that. Yeah. So so no, like that's worth a look. Well, like Williams would get first pick of which tire yeah. compound they wanted, and Red Bull would just be left with whatever choice they had. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I like that. See. Yeah. I, there's, there's this element of people wanting to spice up the race by putting in a bunch of regulations, and I think sometimes they work, but they're so difficult to get right. But using prior performance to handicap you, but in a way that isn't de- that isn't dependent on you making choices, but is effectively independent on everybody else making choices, I think is more interesting. Yeah. Uh, so we we run down Merck pretty well. I, I do think... I'm not entirely sold that uh, both drivers are equal at Mercedes right now. Uh, I, I no. think, I think George. They might be trying to make George the number one driver. I, I, this is the paradox that Mercedes has, right? The reality is, is they all know that Lewis is going to retire in the next five years. Like that's the thing that's going to happen, and they need to, separate from the fact that the car is a tractor, they need to make sure that they have their talent, and they need their talent to be optimized. They need them well integrated with the team so that they're ready to work. That means they have to invest in them. Part of that is you need the experience. You do need to be out there fighting against Max, which means that you sometimes have to say, sorry, Lewis, you don't need that experience or that practice, but George does. And I think that is probably the 
sane thing that's going on behind the scenes, or the, the logical thing that's going on behind the scenes. But when you look at it through the lens of the fact that Lewis sometimes goes, ah, I just can't be bothered. I think it, it, it creates a different public perception where George, they, they, they've given up on Lewis to the perspective of we think George is better than Lewis, so let's just give George all the opportunities. Um, I, I do think, one more thing on the subject of Merck, that I think a lot of people and the commentators do a bad job on this. Merck, for the longest time, have had a rule the car in front gets preference. That's always how it's been. They've said that since even the Nico Rosberg days. And that's how they run their team. And that is especially true when there's no championship on the line. Yet the commentators and the press keep wanting to make more out of it when it's like, no, who are they going to pit first? Oh, Lewis is complaining about his tires. Maybe they'll pit Lewis first. Oh my God, they pitted George. Well, it's because he was in front. That's what they do, right? That's their policy. So, I will say all this tees up Lewis nicely to move to Aston Martin. Speaking of Aston Martin, uh, what were your thoughts on them for the weekend? I thought it was interesting. It was surprising the both between the performance they've had in the season so far, and I think also some of the performance they had on Saturday and uh, not Saturday FP one and FP two. That I think they they under delivered in their performance relative to what their expectations were. And I don't know whether that's because the car turns out to be a little bit track dependent, or whether there's something else going on behind the scenes. Because I think. I think if you look at Alonso's performance, like he was clearly out driving Stroll. I think I'm going to give Stroll the benefit of the doubt because he's still got broken hands. Um, but I feel that Alonso could have done better. He clearly, in a few occasions, managed to push in on Lewis. And maybe it was the fact that Lewis was just... Lewis could deal with it and therefore he had the pace this time and he had the, the motivation to go do it. And that's really what was being shown. But I'm reading between the lines, I feel like the car was not as fast as, they, as Aston Martin thought it was, slash the paddock thinks it is because it should have done better right based on the previous two races yeah i mean i think lewis for the most part was racing most of that race in clear air even though he was in second place max was just so far up the road yeah. that like you know he could really manage that situation to be like oh alonzo's closing up okay I'll, I'll get a little bit more out of my car oh he fell back a little bit okay we'll manage for a little bit so i think he was realizing he was not going to catch the red bull and it was, what yep. can I do to keep Alonzo behind? And I think he did a great job of that. I'm not convinced on... Uh, I, my, my leash is running out for, for Stroll. I, I think it is quickly becoming apparent, uh, you know, punting Charles off. You know, I know it was opening opening lap. I know turn three is yeah. ra rather narrow, and he really didn't have anywhere else to go. Uh, but I think he was very lucky to get a fourth place out of the deal uh, at the end of the race. Um, yeah. But I know Fernando Alonso is this great Formula One driver. I don't think he is the form or the Fernando Alonso of say 2005 to 2012. I think no. he has definitely lost something. And you know, you look at I mean, we've already mentioned Nico Rosberg once on this podcast. Uh, but you look back to like when he and Schumacher were paired together uh, right after the Braun years at Mercedes. Yeah. Nico handed it to Michael. Like Michael never yeah. was the same Michael that no. that he was. So, you know, I, I think if Stroll wants some time, wants to remain in the sport, he's got to start beating Nando. Yeah, he does. I, I absolutely do. I, but the the thing that makes that such a complex dynamic is that the team's owned by his dad. And I know that, like, putting aside all the the jokes about it. There is clearly a family dynamic there, and I think that changes the evaluation. I don't know whether that changes it in the context of how harsh or how not harsh the team is on Stroll and their expectations. But there's also the other side of that, which Stroll knows that he gets not a free pass, but he doesn't have to try as hard as, say, I don't know, um, let's say you put Mick Schumacher in that seat. He does not have to try as hard as that because his dad owns the team. Yeah, I, I still think it's going to be one of those cases of it, this was fine when they were solidly in the midfield, but as they are getting closer and closer to the pointy end, you know, uh, to talk about Red Bull briefly, we saw that with Red Bull in what 2019 and 2020 when yeah. it was the the Gasly Albon rotating show of like, hey, it's uh, it, it can be anyone at any time, but we need another driver because like most of our championship points are coming from Max and we can't allow that. Yeah, I mean, it's not that you can't allow that Max is the one giving the championship points. It's the it's it's less the it's not you can't allow it. It's that you're yeah. leaving money on the table. Um, yeah, and, it's and, if you want to bring the fight to Mercedes for the world championship, and and we're talking 2019. Right. Like you have to have both cars up there. You can't rely on you know Absolutely. Max to do it all. And I, uh, I, 
if we're going to go on the spicy uh, side of Red Bull, Daniel Ricciardo was in the paddock this weekend. Well, that's because it was his home race. Did you see? Uh, did you see the conspiracy theory about the uh, Checo deleted tweet? I did not. There was a Checo deleted tweet. There was a Checo deleted tweet. So after Jetta, he uh, he posted something like, you know, great race race win, loved it, all all the positive things, and then he said something like, I want to be champion. And then deleted that tweet, posted the exact same tweet without the phrase, I want to be champion. So I'm sitting here with my mouth at gog because I'm conf- I, like, my mind is just blown that that required a, I'm so confused. Yeah. Like the, the, the ultimate paradox with that, right? Like is Max doesn't need help to be the champion. Like as much as I am not a Max fan, he's an extremely good race driver, Right. Indepe- like he is consistently for years outperformed that car for years and now he has a car that performs well he's performing even better in it like he doesn't need help and so in the context of the dynamic in the team no you don't want to set them up so that they're punching each other in the face but i don't think you need checo to go delete it like i can imagine the helmet marker on the phone being like yeah you're not to be removing the message yes. it's not acceptable to say that you want to be the champion like i i, I, I don't understand that. that that's so interesting yeah but i think I think that, you know, if you really want to go uh, Darth Helmet or a Darth Helmet Marco on this, uh, you know, you put you bring Daniel Ricardo into into the paddock into Australia of like, if you don't play well, we have this perfectly fine Australian driver who was more than happy to who we know gets along well with Max. They are still very good friends, it seems. Um, and, you know, he, he I think he'd be perfectly fine being in the car and picking up the scraps. Do you, if you're if you're going to have got kicked out of F1 by being an underperformer, and I know there are other drivers, but we're talking about Mr. Ricardo here. Do you think he would come back in a blaze of glory to Red Bull, who's taking a risk on you, and be like, you know, I'm just going to drive around and make sure that you know I make sure nobody can overtake Max? Like it feels like that comeback. If you're going to do that, you have to come back with a fire and an excitement and a desire to do to get that WDC. See, I think it's the I think it's more of the Kimi Raikkonen path of he knows he had a shot, he knows he had a really good shot. Then then he tried to you know go on his own path, do his own thing. Uh and then, you know, at the end of the day, it's more of a hobby to him really and you know, I I think it's good for him to be in the show. I think he's He's the kind of driver that, you know, if, if Max gets punted off by Botas or something or, you know, has a bad day, he can clear up the uh, he can clear up the, the win if, if need be. But, you know, I, I think I, I think he realizes, especially after his years at Renault and McLaren, that like maybe his best days are behind him or he was never going to get that top spot that he wanted. So. Yeah, I, I could see him just being uh, a happy second driver, the, the Kimi to Sebastian, essentially. It, it's interesting, especially as I think Red Bull has learned after many years with Checo, right? But the, the, the choices they made when they had Albon and Kvyat and uh, Gasly in the second seat as an attempt to to grow their next driver. I think they have learned by picking Checo and saying, actually, what well, we don't need a driver in the second seat who's going to be, who needs to learn. We need a driver in the second seat who's just going to come in and do it as a, you know, do their business. At the end of the day, Ricardo is still a, a Red Bull Academy driver and they know who he is and they have a best interest in him and Checo is not. So if you want to keep your Red Bull driving family, you know, the prodigal son of Daniel Ricardo returns and you know, I, I have never heard anybody in Formula One circles speak poorly of Daniel Ricciardo. You know, maybe maybe he doesn't have the best performance on track, but we all want him to do the best performance on track because he's nothing but smiles. He's a great ambassador to the sport. You know, and if you have a prickly driver like Max Verstappen, he's a great balance out of, we'll go let Daniel do all the PR to because everybody sure. loves the smiling Australian. Okay, should we try and wrap up the last few of these items on Melbourne before we go on to some rumors slash... Uh, doing the wrap-up. Uh, sure. We're trying to hit these on the full list. Uh, I'd say, I think you mentioned this earlier, but I think I want to reiterate it. The race, the race was really close. It was, was great overtaking. Everybody was driving close. It didn't spread out. Everybody was reasonable and honest. Nobody was banging into each other like, a, like an idiot except Gasly, but I'll give him this one. I thought that was pretty good. I think that's what we want to see from F1. Um, it was interesting that F2 actually had the same thing going on, so that was great. I think what might be my spiciest take of the weekend was the FIA, I think, got everything right. They did. 
and they were quick about it. They weren't taking like forever to call safety cars or red flags. Like they were like, boom, they were on it. Yeah, but but even then, after the second red flag that resulted in the craziest start sequence, where hey, uh, where everybody pretty much knew you had the next three corners to change your position or you're stuck there, like yeah. The chaos that ensued from that, they, they called the red flag quickly, maybe a little too quickly, because if you let them go through the first sector, then maybe we're talking about Hulkenberg finally getting his first podium. Uh, but because they, that would be the one thing is like, do you really need to call the red flag that quickly? Can you, or can you just let them, you know, get through the first sector and then call things? Depends what you think the purpose of the stewards is. Are they there to enforce safety and predictability? Or are they trying to enforce fairness? Because I think there's two different aspects to that, right? The predictability and the safety, yeah, I think they should have just let the drivers go forward one more sector and just been like, done. But if you're trying to create fairness, then stopping it where you did was actually the right thing to do. I'm not sure which one it was, but they called it so quickly. I mean, if you look back at the replays, it was a full-on train wreck. There were cars everywhere. They had to call a red flag, and I think it was on the bubble whether they called it too early. I, I think I think if you're going to talk safety, then they also have to call it early because the sooner you call the red flag, the sooner you can start getting people out onto the track to make sure everybody's okay, you know, see where medical attention needs to be because, you know, if, if there's still technically green flag racing through the first sector, like I'm not sure if you can start throwing people out onto the track. You, you send the medical, the medical car's right there anyway, so the medical car would have been able to come in and you only need to let them go for maybe 10, 15 more seconds before... Um, you would have needed to, before you would have called the red flag anyway, and because it's going forward rather than behind, it would have been pretty safe to be able to do that. Yeah. I, 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 again, I think it's a difficult call to make. I, I think some of those red flags were a little, the first two were a little controversial in the sense of like, are we really calling a red flag for gravel? But man, there was a lot of gravel on the track. There was a lot of Williams car on the track. And, you know, yeah. I think the worst thing you want is for somebody to pick up a puncture through all that or throw gravel into somebody's face. Like what happened? Yes. I, I mean, I guess what massa was technically a spring but you don't want to throw yeah. something into somebody's face and that would be bad and uh on the second one like yeah there was Haas car all over the the road yeah. and yeah, yeah so i i totally understand i personally think if we are inside like five laps to go i would much rather see a red flag than and we'll do another standing start for two laps than a finish under the safety car no, I, I agree. I, I, I think as, mu as much as I think it plays onto Abu Dhabi and, oh, I should have made a different decision, I think it does net out. In actual fact, it's going to sound weird. I think in some ways it's safer, right? I think it creates a better dynamic. There's Because if you're doing a restart, you're going to move slower initially. I still know that you get up to speed, but that, that, that moment of peril at the beginning of the first two or three corners tends not to be as bad as it is later on. And I think what happens in those safety car cases is the cars back everybody up, everybody's tires actually get colder, and they've already got the dodgy tires. And I think it just leads to a slightly different incentive than it is when you'd restart the race, so close to the end. Um, but yes, uh, I agree. Yeah, and I mean, think about how differently we would talk about Abu Dhabi if they red flagged it, and then we got Max versus Lewis for like two, three laps on both on fresh, soft tires. Like, man, that would I, have been, that would have been interesting. Yeah, that would have been. I think in the weirdest way, I think that would have been a a more spectacular end. It would have been more entertaining. Yeah. Um, for for the end of such a season, especially as they went into the last race with basically yeah. equal points. I, I'm a big fan of several sports, but I think we have to remember that sports primarily are for entertainment. So yes. if we can do the entertaining things, let's do the entertaining things. and it, Entertaining and, and being fair. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I am disappointed that on the we're just going to roll to the grid, nobody took the opportunity just for the memes to throw on some full wets or something. Like how great would that have been for, you know, Max to throw on the full wet tire, drive across the line, and just be like, hey, guess who's the only F1 driver to win a race on full wet tires while at a completely dry race? Oh, what a great trivia question. Like, uh, Yeah, I, love, I, I totally agree. I think that, that more, they should embrace more of that. I think there's a, 
aspect of these situations where they still they're wearing their serious hat and they need to react realize that at the end of the day they should play their comedy hat but but you know what would have happened if they'd done that max would have been driving round because they'd have been trying to do whatever it was that they were trying to do and his tire would have gone pop or something would have happened and they'd have been like well that's because you did something stupid and you tried to be funny oh absolutely if if he lost it went off the track and then like lewis was able to overtake him because he technically he left the track then it's like why did you put him out on full wets just for the meme? So I totally understand why they did it, but you know, uh, yeah. And then, okay. oh man, that Carlos signs penalty, like that's the uh. that is the right penalty. That I, I absolutely agree. He should have gotten that five second penalty. However, the application of that penalty is just like I think the punishment did not fit the crime. Yeah, I think I. Th- it was only because they couldn't do one more lap, right? I think in in the re- in the real world, if they'd been able to do one more racing lap, then I think the five second applied would have been more reasonable because the field would have stretched out more than the point one second that it really did. I mean, I think in my opinion, if you're going to talk about what's the fairest thing they could have done, is look back to what the time gaps were prior to the um, the Magnuson crash. Yeah. See what see where five seconds would have dropped him back to, and given him a that place penalty. For the next race? No, no, just just for this race. Oh, so in this so, race? If, so I, if it would have dropped is, him back to like seven. Is that even seventh, a thing that they can do though? Did they? I have don't the think it is. Give, yeah, I don't think it is. I did wonder whether they should have given him a a, 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 a like a five grid pace uh, penalty for the next race. I, yeah. In some respects, I kind of feel like that would have been more honest but then the other flip side of that is you have to look at what that caused right it took out both aston martins it really at the end of the day caused the two um alpines to crash out and so in the context of making sure he doesn't gain from his mistake right like he would have gained in this one whereas if you pushed him into the next race i think i think that would have resulted in some respects an unfair application oh i totally agree i just think in some places they need to say like five seconds or you know three three positions essentially because I, yes. I think some position penalties could get interesting especially for cases like this of you know hey we have you know, that five because that five second penalty that dropped him all the way back to 12 and he was not i'm not saying he should have gotten off scot-free but like you know no. seventh i think would have been a good punishment essentially for for where he for his crimes well, going back to Ferrari going to Ferrari, they were the ones in qualifying saying, oh, rain at the end of the session, rain at the end of the session. <laughs> and they were out of sync with everybody else on the final runs and didn't get the grid position that they would have gone for or they maybe should have gotten. But, I mean, I kind of understand what you're saying. But, I mean, Merck put their, their cars two and three on the grid. Yeah. Uh, if Checo's there, maybe two and four, three and four. Um, yeah. Maybe. I mean, that was a good time by George, and sometimes Checo is... I, I forgot, Checo is a street racing specialist, so it would have been three and four. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it, it's it's tough to know, though, because like, I, I can see it both ways. I think it's one of those we'll have to wait and see, because also sometimes, you know... I mean, for years, Red Bull was a car that was alive at Monaco and Singapore and Hungary and not many other mm-hmm. tracks. So, mm-hmm. you know, did, did, do they just know Australia very well and had Albert Park dialed in? Like, well, I think time will tell. I'm not totally yeah. willing to write off that this wasn't on pure pace. I'm not willing to either, but I think it just calls into question that it's not as big a step forward as uh, the headlines would otherwise suggest. Sure, because there were multiple times in that race where... You know, signs. They the commentators made comments about signs is doing the same laps times as Verstappen. Like all these drivers were doing the same lap times as either Max or Lewis. So it was a bit of a, especially after the first red flag, it was a bit of a management race to some extent. Yeah. And yeah, yeah so we we shall see. I I, I think Merck might have pulled themselves out of being the fourth best car because uh, Ferrari gonna Ferrari. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. Hot takes and rumors. You should go first, Andrew. Okay. Uh, my my best hot take from the weekend is that the reason why Baltas had absolutely no pace in Australia is because the Aussie mullet gods know that that mullet is fake and he is a Finnish imposter. And because he is not truly one of them and Alpha does not make a ute, there is no way they will allow the mullet to have good vibes in Australia. He might fool the I- rest of the world, but he does not fool the Aussies. I will subscribe to this. The question is, if Alfa Romeo had a ute, 
would that have allowed the gods to make an exception for his mullet? Absolutely, but I don't know if the Italians okay. know the first thing about making a Ute because you got to put a big put a big V eight engine in one. Yes, but you know, you also have to not forget the fact that the Italians make some really good small utility vehicles. They have the little Fiat things that are like little vans with a with a pickup on the back of them that are basically a motorcycle. Man, the, 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 the Fiat would understand what to do, but then you mate it to the Ferrari genetics that are within that organization, and they might have what you're looking for. I'm not sure that's working class enough to be a Ute, but I like the I like the theory. It'll work. I will see what happens. I'll get on to Alfa Romeo on the weekend. And see yeah, there you go. Okay, so let's go for my spicy takes, which are going to be ridiculous, as they always are. Um, so this one's kind of a meta take. It was after seeing um, uh, McLaren do so badly in the reorganization that they've gone through, and um, what this means for Lando. So Max and Lando have made the same mistake that many Gen Zs make. They think their employer is family. They've made long-term commitments to their teams, and they talk about them in a very supportive manner. They have, on occasion, used the term family, right? What does this really mean? How is this playing out? You're seeing it with Lando. His golden boy status uh, has been t is being tarnished forever by stuck with a team who can't capitalize on their money, their brand, their legacy, or opportunity, right? We've got these technical team changes where they fired the guy that they got from Toro Rosso, I mean, Alpha Tori, who has clearly not built them a great car, and they've got a new guy coming in for a Ferrari. They seem to have built reasonable cars. McLaren seem to have good reliability. But what does this mean for Lando? He's going to have to wait until 2024 for the new guy to even think about influencing the car. Then that really means that it's going to be 2025. And that's on the assumption that the rest of the team that coerces around him will be able to successfully pull off. They're building a new wind tunnel. Sweet. They showed it off this week. But Merck and Ferrari had terrible problems with their CFDs. Ferrari especially spent three years trying to fix the correlation between their new tunnel and their new simulator. And the co this really means at the end of the day that Lando is not really going to have a chance to win until 2026. But his contract is up in 2025. And he needs to start thinking about what that means today, right? Like, th this, this, is, this is just... He is losing the best years of his career because he's so wedded to this family. He has signed up for them. He had the opportunity to go to Red Bull. Can you imagine Lando Norris in a Red Bull? And he's made these mistakes because he thinks about it as a family. Oh, I don't think he went far enough on this because I think there's another driver you need to include in this, and that is Charles Leclerc. He is another young driver that has penned a long contract to a team that, while does maybe show glimpses of success and promise, routinely lets Charles down. We didn't even talk about in Saudi Arabia the, uh, Javi, you have to tell me when like I need to push between the safety car lines. Like He could have gotten past Lewis there, and Javi didn't tell him until he was almost in turn one. I, I agree with the uh, symptom, but the cause is different, which is to say that Charles is not wedded to Ferrari like it's a family. Like He is aware of what, fa of what Ferrari family really is, and he is willing to criticize them and accept them. Like, I mean, he got told off by Bonotto for criticizing the Ferrari family. He is not in that family in the same way that Lando is in the McLaren family. Oh, I don't know. Let, let's not forget why Charles was so dead set on going to Ferrari because of Jules. I, th there's, there's an aspirate again. There's a difference between the aspiration and the love of Ferrari, which I fully accept every driver needs to at least partially love their team. But do you see it as a warm, hugging embrace of a family? Are you making that mistake? I don't think Charles has made the mistake that he sees Ferrari as a warm, hugging embrace, which is the mistake that Lando has made. I think, I'll come to this in a moment, but I think Max has made the same mistake. I don't think Charles has. I don't think he looks at that, that team as a warm embrace. He, he sees them for all their warts. I would say that Max sees Red Bull... In the same warm, loving embrace that he gets from his father. Oh, now you know, that's a little harsh. I don't, I don't think he sees Red Bull quite a lot. Like, I think behind the scenes, I think he loves Red Bull. I think he is very much a Red Bull person. So are you um, suggesting behind I, the scenes he doesn't love his father? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Unquestionably. Uh, no, I, I think no reality... we all know in the, in the Yoss Verstappen world of teaching, love is equated with performance. Red Bull gives him performance, thus he loves a Red Bull. Max wins championships, thus Yoss loves Max. Absolutely, but that's not a transitive property. It's not a two-way street. It only flows one way. Oh, yeah. Max doesn't, love his, Max doesn't love his dad, but he does love Red Bull. 
what? but I think if you look at if you look at Max, he's signed until twenty twenty eight, right? We've got a reg change in the middle of that. There's the reality that at some point Red Bull will drop the ball because all teams eventually drop the ball. Like Mercedes has dropped it, McLaren dropped it, Williams dropped it, Ferrari. There is not a single team on the grid today that has not dropped the ball. And Max is going to get make the same mistake. And you know, you know that the moment his performance drops, Helmut Marko will be there, with, you know, on the Ides of March with the knives to stab him in the back and kick him out. He'll kick him down to Alpha Tori or whatever it gets called by that point if his performance drops. And they're making this mistake. Lando and Max have made this mistake. And I think they need to be more like Frank Williams and less happy dippy in their relationship with their employer. At, at the risk of um, turning this rather serious yet filled with fun banter podcast into an even more ridiculous meme show, uh, which team principal do you think is the best racing daddy on the grid? Because I think I would go with Christian Horner. I said, ooh, I don't know about that. Christy, Christian Horner, as a racing dad, is the guy that when you bring home your report card at the end of the school season and you have done great, oh man, it's the best thing in the world. He loves you, right? You come home with some bad grades. He doesn't beat you. He's not angry at you, but he doesn't show you the love. He's like, you know, you'll try again next year, but he doesn't give you the support. What he does is he goes to your sibling who did get the A's and gives them the love instead because that's the one that really matters. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about dad, um, uh, uh, Flipping it. Dad team principles. I think Toto could be in the running, I think. But I think he's also very fickle, as we see with Lewis and George. Then we know what the proper answer is. It's got to be Zach Brown. I mean, he goes out and finds orphan drivers and brings them into his steed yeah. and gives them a chance to try to grow. Sure, it's a crap car, but he cares deeply about those drivers. I, 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 will, I will accept that as a potential option, but you have just made me realize that actually it's Gunter Steiner. He's the ultimate dad team principal. He supports you. He does give the opportunity. He will forgive you, but he will also give you the tough love when you need it. I'm not wrong, am I? I'm okay with this trend. I mean, may okay. maybe maybe not if you're a you're Mazepin, but everybody else, sure. <laughs> Mazepin was the friend that your kid has brought home that you don't think they should be hanging out with, but you know there's nothing you can do about it because it means that your kid gets a scholarship. The more I think about it, definitely I think Gunter Steiner is possibly the, the uh, team principal dad you want because he was willing to go and argue that uh, we should go with the first uh, red flag uh, result standings just to try to get Nico that one podium he so desperately needs when there was no way they were ever going to reverse that any sort of order. But I, I appreciate Haas for trying, but they should never have tried that. But if we're going to talk who is the best team principal dad, it has to be, uh, it, I think you're right, it is Gunter Steiner. Yep, it's a wild card, but it's right there. I'm ever more convinced that Lewis is seriously considering uh, booking it out of the paddock after this season, right? Like, he keeps... To the way he keeps not really trying, and the way he we're holding on for the contract, and the way that Toto keeps promising to give him a better car, right? I think the conversation has gone down like this. So, Lewis... You're going to stay, yes? Nah, it's a tractor. I'm old. This is not worth it. No, Lewis. I promise to make the car better next year. Let's give it one more shot for old time's sake. And then, Lewis, let me think about it. Because, you know, you just don't want to deal with Toto. Time passes. December 2023. Get the press release saying, nah, I'm good. And then Toto goes to Zach. Want to do a driver swap? You get me. Can we get Lando? That. That is the uh, that is how I think it's going to go down this year. I think we're going to swap Mick for Lando at uh, McLaren, and that's how uh, we're going to end up with Merck in 2024 because uh, Lewis is going to peace out. All right, Dominic. So we got back who next? We got three weeks bet between races at this point, three weekends where we don't know what to do with ourselves. Maybe uh, it's time to get back to the uh, cycling classics. We got Perry Roubaix. Uh, uh, Amstel Gold and Liege Bastogne Liege coming up. Those are all fantastic races. But then we got back. Uh, Amstel Gold is for sure. Okay, I thought they were all beers for a moment then. Uh, no, <laughs> but yeah, Amstel Gold is a very well, a very good race sponsored by a beer company. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So then we got Baku. Do we have any fun predictions for for B Baku? I know there's some teams that have said that's their first upgrade point on the season. So do you think we're going to see any major shakeups in the uh, the team standings? Anybody going to come out swinging? 
I don't think so. I think it's too early, and I think the track is too different for for you to be able to make that judgment. I think any upgrades that they bring will probably work well, but I think it's going to be very difficult to tell how they play out. I think we might see the porpoising be a disaster, but we'll see. Who is most likely to bin it going into the castle section and qualifying? Charles. Just because he's done it before? Yes. Okay. And the uh, Red Bull award for late breaking into turn one, uh, do we see any more of that action? If Checo is close to Max, I absolutely believe that could happen. I uh, I think it would be great if uh, Max was battling Checo, Max was behind, Checo moved, and then Max ran into the back of Checo and they both go careening uh, out of the when way in turn that, one. When has that happened before? There's no way that would happen. No, but it would. But then it's the other way around. So Max is the trailing driver instead of the lead driver. So it's, oh, yeah, okay. it's that poetry symmetry thing to write our uh, sports history, stories. History doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. Back it was about crashes and pole poising. And that's it. It's... Given that we've seen some crazy and wild Bakus, and I think it's been a while since we've had a truly crazy wild Baku, I will say a team that has not scored a podium yet will get a podium. Which team is... You, you mean podium this year? Yes. Okay. I think that's, that's plausible. Has Ferrari gotten a podium? Plausible. I'll say at least a driver who hasn't gotten a podium this year will, uh, will, get, will get a podium. Well, once again, thank you for listening to Tinfoil Helmets. We are always waiting for your feedback, uh, so feel free to write us at uh, feedback at tinfoilhelmets.com. Let us know any conspiracy feedbacks, wants. Also, tell your friends about this podcast if you enjoyed listening to us. Don't forget to rate if you're on a platform that rates because, well, if, if you've enjoyed this, we hope somebody else will as well. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you after Baku.